All right, well, today we have with us John Dyer, the author of From the Garden to the City. John, what does that title mean, From the Garden to the City? Well, um, so when I was growing up as a kid, I, I had that story told to me about how when we go to heaven, you know, we'll be sitting on clouds. And, and I was always afraid to admit that that sounded kind of kind of boring. And then later on, I thought maybe we would go back to a garden and it would be pristine and there wouldn't be much to do. But what I found out was that the Bible doesn't really end that way. It doesn't end with us going on the clouds or going back to garden, but it ends with God bringing a city down full of all the stuff that people have made over over the ages, but somehow redeemed, just like our souls and bodies are redeemed. So the book is is saying that, you know, the, the whole biblical story is this movement from the pristine garden that God gave us to be cultivating and working on and then ultimately ending here in a city. Cool. Well, John, tell us briefly, what is this book about? What does this have to do with technology, the church? What is it about? Well, so I I uh, been a web developer for you know maybe ten years or so, and really enjoy getting to use all this cool stuff for the kingdom of God. But somewhere along the line, a couple of years ago, I started uh, you know coming across those articles about is Google making us stupid or Facebook making us narcissistic, and um, you know started to kind of worry about those things. And so I read all these books and and started to get really freaked out that maybe what I was doing was as a profession was really a bad thing. So I kept kept reading and kept reading, and I eventually found out that you know really really the story of the Bibles um, really tells us that that making stuff and creativity is really part of the image of God. It's something that we can be redeeming. So what I wanted to do was put together, you know, all the cool stuff that we can do with technology, with some of the downsides, with some of that research, but also put it together um, really really in in what our call is not just as Christians to evangelize, but our but our original call as humans who are creative. And so I want to put that all together into one little package. Right. You know, when you read the book, it is it's so wonderful to read. It's 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 so conversational and palatable. At the same time, it's so thought provoking because, you know, you bring up some really interesting points saying that Noah's Ark, the Tower of Babel, these are all pieces of technology. And I would imagine a lot of people have never thought of that. So why should Christians care about technology? Well, I think that what you bring up is, you know, when you think about the Tower of Babel being technology, it doesn't really seem like it. And, and part of the reason for that is that we're all kind of built to say everything before you're born is just stuff. And it's not, we don't really think of it as technology. So we don't really think of cars or airplanes or even electricity as being a technology. But we think of, when we hear the word technology, we think of iPhones and iPads and stuff like that. So when we talk about technology in the church, where we think about should you use your iPhone in church to read your Bible or something like that, but we never go back and think, gosh, you know, 50 or 100 years ago before microphones and cars, there were no mega churches. There weren't thousands of people, and then you didn't have to subdivide the church into you know youth group and college group and all that kind of stuff. And you have to do all that now that we have mega churches, and we have mega churches because we have microphones. So what, what's worth doing is kind of expanding your vision of what you think of as technology. So you can see how all of these things are, are affecting the way that we go about our lives and, and even the way that we, we worship the Lord. So then how does technology fit into the larger biblical story then? Well, so I think I think first off, God is God gives Adam his original command is to take care of that garden, to cultivate it, to keep it, to uh, basically to use tools to transform it into something else. So that you know, God God is creative, and we're His image. So we're going to be creative, and we're going to be building things. Now, at the same time, in that biblical story, we have um, lots of examples of people using technology to kind of insulate themselves from God. Particularly, this begins with Cain, where he makes a city, and he's able to kind of set up almost like an anti-garden, where he's free from the need for God, and he can reject that. And, and that's this other deep track that runs throughout the scriptures. Um, so, I, so I think there, there is both the call of God to be creative, to use tools, and yet to also recognize that in our fallenness, we tend to use them um, in overtly evil ways, but even sometimes in, in ways that we don't really realize are, are affecting and shaping us. I see. So it is in dovetailing with discerning technology, is that where that term comes from? Yeah, so so the term discerning is, is often trying to figure out that technology doesn't usually come down to like an easy yes or no answer. And so one of the examples that a friend gave me was of like the red and green and yellow lights that we, we have in, in American streets. So the red light always means no, always means stop. The green light always means go. 
But the yellow light is somewhere in between where we really have to sit down and, and, and situate ourselves in the whole environment and think, now, do I need to slow down? Do I need to speed up? And it, it really requires some thought and some bigger perspective than just looking at that light. And I think usually the same thing is true of technology. You can't really couch it as good or bad, but it's also not really just plain old neutral. It really requires a lot of thought. That's, you know, I've always thought as technology as being completely neutral. And although I was kind of on the right track, you bring up some <laughs> wonderful points that we all need to be thoughtful about. That it, even though it is neutral, once it's in our hands, it's automatically no longer neutral. It's either good or bad. Yeah, and I think I think an example of of some of an area where where technology can can have some have an effect. It's not it's not evil and it's not really good, but it, it is still this this changing. So the example I often give is. Back when I was a youth pastor, I um, had, you know, half the kids would have Bibles, half the kids wouldn't. So I got a projector and started using that to show the scriptures on the screen. And then I found out after doing that for a while that a lot of kids, know, almost none of the kids brought their Bibles, and those that did wouldn't open it because they all were just reading on screen. Now, whether or not that's good or bad, I, I don't really think that, they're, that that's morally good or morally bad, but it's certainly different. And, and having that technology and projector there did change how the kids interacted with Scripture. And, um, and so being aware of that and not, not just thinking that it doesn't really matter which system you use, that it's not going to have any effect, but, but recognizing that, um, that those things do shape um, even something as intimate as how you encounter the Word of God. Right, you know, we're always moving forward and thinking about, you know, what's the next version, what's the new thing, and yeah. we never actually pause long enough to think, wow, what kind of effects does this have on my life, on other people's lives, on the church? And your book here, Garden of the City, is really helps define and, and creates a lot of thought that really needs to be happening. You know, John, before the interview, I put a tweet out there asking people, you know, do you have any questions? And Ben Terry had a great question. He said, by having a solid understanding of how technology works, where can it be redeeming and where does it need to be careful? Well, I think, I think the, the, um, the powerful aspects of technology to reach people, to connect, all of those things are pretty obvious. We, we all see those. And then all of the really bad things are also pretty obvious. So, you know, um, the, you have all the, all the uh, identity theft and sexting and bomb threats, all that stuff. Those are, those are probably pretty obvious and don't require a lot of extra thought. But I think it's some of those subtle things like the projector thing I just mentioned that um, is worth thinking about where, you know, at first when I had when I figured out that the kids were not opening their Bibles because of the projector, I thought maybe the projector was really bad. And then I kind of thought about it more and I thought, you know, it's only been for the last 100, 100, 200 years or so that people have been bringing their own Bibles. And really only for the last like 20 or 30 years have people had like their own personalized covers and translations and all that kind of stuff. So actually, by projecting it on screen, we're actually uh, all reading the exact same thing and maybe having a more communal-like experience than what church has been like for the last 50 or 60 years. So sometimes, you know, thinking about it in a little bit of a backwards way or thinking about um, really how to use technology in a, in a disruptive way that's out of the ordinary, I think is probably the most powerful thing you can do. So. Oftentimes when, you, when you're speaking and maybe you have like a, you're using slides or keynote or something like that, you, you show a really obvious image of what you're talking about. But on the other hand, you know, um, sometimes what you can do is put a passage of scripture up and not read it and have the audience read it silently. And then that makes this really powerful connection that they, they have to be reading it. They can't just zone out. So sometimes doing things in a um, sort of disruptive fashion can be the thing that actually catches people's attention and reconnects them to something vital like scripture. Real quick, John, tell us why we should read your book. Well, I think um, I think it brings, for me anyway, I wrote it probably for me. And I, what I wanted to do was really be able to balance all of this great stuff we know technology can do, all the bad stuff we hear about in the news, but also just that deep sense of, of being the image of God and, and reflecting his creativity and how to balance all of those things together. Because it's, it's really a lot more complex than just, you know, use it for good and not for bad. There's really a lot more going on. And um, and so I, I wanted to be able to put all those things together and to feel encouraged that when I write code and even when the code looks like this and I get a blue screen, <laughs> that um, there's still something good going on back there and, and um, that, that we can, in a sense, redeem technology and we can honor God with it while, while still being aware of some of the downsides. Well, there's a lot of good things going on with this book. It was a delightful read and I encourage everyone to read From the Garden to the City by you, John Dyer, an excellent read, and we'll have the details. There it is. We'll have the details on how you can get your hands on this book in the post. John, thank you for your time.
You got it, man. Thanks for having me.